For those of you who are new or for those of you who have not attended one of our Emerging Leadership Seminars, my name is Matthew Frankel and we've been hosting these for a couple of years. Uh, last, uh, last session, a couple weeks ago, we had um, Mo Butler here who um, we kind of made a little bit of news. Um, the following, Mo, if you guys remember, was um, is, is Senator Booker's senior advisor. And the day after he came to visit Brooklyn College, um, Senator Booker announced uh, that he was going to be running for president. So we were really lucky to have Mo here to provide his story, to provide his perspective and background on uh, politics in New Jersey. Today we are equally as lucky um, to have uh, Chanel McLeod join us. Chanel is the executive director of an organization that we'll learn more about today called Project Ready. Um, she also happens to be one of my closest friends and I'm so thrilled that her story, her passion, uh, and her experience will be um, showcased today. Um, you know, the most important thing of this session, as a reminder, is that uh, what we try to do is, is to try to define career pathways, um, give definition to what people do for a living, and hopefully provide some inspiration on the um, kind of work that all of us could be part of uh, down the line, and to provide their perspectives on how they got their jobs, which uh, is, I think, a big part of, of uh, our continuing development uh, as professionals. Um, I think a, a few others may trickle in in the next couple minutes, but I think we can go ahead and start. Um, and I'm going to start, as I always do, with some very basic preliminary questions of our guests. And I'll start off asking Chanel to talk a little bit about currently what she does as the executive director of Project Ready and what Project Ready is about. And then we'll unpack that a little bit and then we'll open it up for discussion. So Chanel, welcome. Welcome to Bloomfield Thank College. You. Thank you for having me. And, uh, and, and why don't you tell us a little bit, it's a new organization, it's something that obviously means a great deal to Northern Jersey, to the state, specifically Newark. Uh, talk to us a little bit about Project Ready and what you're trying to do in, in, in creating this organization. Yeah. Uh, so hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. My name is Chanel McLeod. I'm the executive director of Project Ready. Uh, Project Ready was founded in August of last year, so it's a very new organization. And the goal of the organization is to promote and protect high quality education across the city of Newark. Um, we started off with just me uh, working toward Project Ready with this you know, vision to bring people together, to activate our community, to make sure that our kids have everything it is that they need in order to be successful. And now at this point, I think I probably have about 14 people working for Project Ready. Um, we have uh, organizers who are working for us, canvassers working for us, a campaign manager, a field director. Um, and our current project right now is getting 1,000 1, Yorkers to vote by mail by filling out their vote by mail application. Uh, and so effective uh, this morning, we are at 670 applications. Uh, and March 2nd, we're, oh, we're hopeful that we'll get to 1,000. That's our goal. So I, I, like I said, I do want to unpack that a little bit, um, both in terms of who you are and also defining a little bit about Project Ready. But just knowing you and knowing your experience, um, I want to talk a little bit first about your pathway to, re to get into this position. But starting off first, to talk a little bit about you as what I would deem as a community organizer. And that's something we heard a lot about from President Obama uh, when he first ran for president. But I, I, I kind of view you as one of the quintessential community organizers in Newark, um, someone who's deeply involved in the, in, in the city and in, in its community, um, and, and providing value to families through, through, the, through action, through organization. So when I, when I talk to you or when I question about what a community, community organizer is, uh, define for us a little bit what that means um, and, and also more importantly, how you discovered that passion um, as someone who uh, you know, does such great work on the community level. What is a community organizer and, and also as a career and also how did you discover that? How did you, how did, what led to you discovering this being your passion? Absolutely. So I, I think I'll go with the second part of your question first. It was actually a little difficult to talk about Project Ready without talking about first how Project Ready even became, even came into existence. Um, so I uh, was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, and I went to school in Newark, New Jersey, and I had two very different things happened to me when I was in one school where 
I didn't necessarily feel like I had teachers who actually cared about the direction I was headed versus another school where I felt like teachers did care about the direction I was headed. They cared about me as a person. They cared about where I was headed educationally. And so I was on one track um, at my first school, and this is where I had the initial experience where I actually had a teacher who told me that I was dyslexic, and because I was dyslexic, I would never become anything. And it was when she told me that, I think I was in what, maybe third grade, um, that obviously plagued me a lot because I thought to myself, okay, I have dyslexia, I don't even know what this means, I don't know how to even engage with what she's saying, and I also feel like maybe there is a world where I don't actually become something where I thought that, that I could. Um, and so after she told me that, I went home, I told my parents, they immediately got me out. Um, and they transferred me over to a school in East Orange. And we would have to go into the school in East Orange every morning. I would have to get there around like 5 a.m., get to my grandmother's house. And I didn't know why I was getting there so early, but I realized as uh, the years went on that I was getting there early because a truancy officer would come around and they would actually check to make sure that I was supposed to be in East Orange. Um, and so while we were not discovered, I later on realized in my career that my mom had me in East Orange because she felt like I could get the quality education that I deserved. She didn't necessarily feel like she could find that in Newark. Um, and so I actually wound up being in the gifted and talented program there, which was a stark difference from uh, what my former teacher had told me back in my other school. And so from there, I wound up going to North Star Academy. Um, which is a charter school in Newark. Uh, they're part of the uncommon schools across uh, the country. And it was there that I had teachers who wanted to know about me as a person. They wanted to know about the direction that I was headed. They wanted me to go to college. They believed that I could. And it was their belief and support system that they had in me that had me very well prepared to go to Rutgers University. But I had a lot of friends around me that did not have that same opportunity. The friends around me that had graduated from high school, and to be very honest with you, couldn't even read or write. Um, so education has always been something that was paramount to me and central to me and something that I wanted to do. But what was also important to me was television and journalism and radio. And so when I was in college, I thought that I was gonna be a radio personality. Um, I was doing a bunch of classes, getting ready to be on like Hot 97 or something like that. Um, and what I realized within journalism is, is that you you get involved in like a back and forth conversation with people and you're, you're actually bringing out their story. You're learning more about who they are. Um, and so I actually was one day at a career fair and Uncommon was there, North Star Academy at the time, and they were like, Chanel, what are you doing here? You need to come and you need to help us recruit teachers. And so I was like, that's not a big deal. I just have to go up to people, I have to talk to them, ask some questions, get their resume. Um, and so I wind up actually doing a bunch of career fairs and had no idea that recruitment was actually a profession. Um, so Fast forward, I somehow landed a position at Lehman Brothers before it closed. Uh, that's because I knew a couple of people who had worked at Lehman Brothers, uh, Uncommon had connected me with some people. And so I wound up on the trading floor, and I am awful with math, but I was on the trading floor, looking at these people throwing their ties back, like moving stock, and I was like, okay, this is not, this is definitely not what I want to do. Um, it's not. It's not, I didn't feel like when I was waking up in the morning that I was making a difference. I felt like I was in, involved in a company that was moving money and I just wasn't excited about that. Um, so flash forward, I wound up getting a position at Kip, New Jersey as a recruiter. And when I read the position, I was like, recruiter, what? What is that? I didn't even know this existed. And it wound up being very similar to journalism because you're asking people questions, you're getting responses from them, you're investigating, and you're trying to actually match them to teaching for kids, kids that matter to me, kids from my community. Um, and so that's how I wound up in recruitment. But I felt like as I was doing recruitment even, that there was something that I needed to be doing to actually move our community forward. I knew getting teachers in was moving the community, but I knew that it was only happening in a, a, a small area. It was only happening within Kip. 
And so after I directed advocacy for a couple of years, I got into organizing. And I felt like organizing was very similar to recruitment in that you're trying to bring people in. It was very similar to journalism in that you want to hear people's story, but then there was some action behind it. And the action was, okay, you feel something, you think something, you want something, now what are you going to do about it? And so that's how organizing uh, came about. Well, I, I want to I wanna take a step back because I think one of the big parts of, the, of this seminar is, is, is to network to get an understanding of career pathways, but also to um, to, to face challenges and to, and to build strategies when we are faced with challenges. And everyone who, who sat in this chair at one point has talked about uh, a challenge or someone who has put their brakes on their dreams. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you said what you said earlier about being in school, being told that you were going to amount to nothing. Um, and, and, and that you were dyslexic and that you wouldn't be able to have a career. How, a lot, of, a lot of the challenges or a lot of the points where we build success in our lives uh, is the choice of whether we're gonna believe those folks uh, or we're gonna go in another, go in another direction. So what, what, what created that perseverance that you had? What, what helped you through that moment, that obviously very important moment in your, in your development where you had a, an adult figure putting the brakes on your dreams? Because I, I think all of us in some capacity have been there. Perhaps some folks uh, in the audience will want to share some of their experiences like that. Um, but, but talk to us a little bit about not just how it felt, but how you got through that challenge. I mean, when she told me about it, I, I initially felt confused, but then after that, I felt awful. Felt confused because I didn't know what dyslexia was. Um, and then once I got more information about what it was, I felt awful because I felt like it was something that I potentially wasn't going to be able to conquer. I mean, I was in third grade. Who knows how to even process some information like that? Um, slash, what teacher delivers that type of information without a parent present? <laughs> that, I learned that later on in my career. Um, I, I think what really did it for me and what really turned things around were my parents. Uh, my parents were very active, they were supportive, they got on the ground with me, uh, they, they wanted to know uh, what was going on and then they also worked with me in order to identify what school actually made sense for me. If this was a school that would deliver information like this to me, potentially wouldn't be able to help me turn it around, didn't believe in me, then that wasn't the right school for me. And so that's when they had transitioned me out to East Orange, which was trying considering the fact that we didn't live in East Orange. I lived on Avon and Bergen and Newark. Um, but that's what actually did it for me. I think moving, so moving a little bit forward into my life, I wound up having two babies. I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, and they are now actively in school. And I think it's having them and then starting to get into organizing that made me see that it really actually does take a village in order to raise a child. All parties have to be actively involved. And if you don't have all parties actively involved, then it's going to make it difficult for that child to be able to persevere through the challenges that they're experiencing. And for those of us who are sitting in the audience and, and thinking about their challenges, how to discover perseverance, how to create determination in their lives. What kind of advice do you have? I mean, it does take a village. We all need various aspects of our lives um, sort of ticking, you know, in order to provide the support that we need to succeed. But um, that isn't always going to be the case. So what, what do you do in a situation like that? I mean, I could, uh, flashing forward from third grade, because I think that I was so young then, when I transitioned into directing advocacy, to be honest, I had probably I'd say about eight women who I looked up to, who I valued, who I thought these eight women are doing the right things by the community and if I could just talk to them, if I could just align with them, then I could probably be successful in really making change in the community. And I say out of the eight women, I only had one that was actually open to supporting me. Um, the other women had done a, a, a but it varied from vicious things that they did to cruel things that they did to 
a bunch of backstabbing. Uh, I had never seen anything like it before in my entire career. So these were like a, a handful of potential mentors that you wanted that you People see that now. you see and you're like, if I could just talk to this person, if I could just get 10 minutes of time with that person, or if I could just get them to support me in any way, then I know that I can be successful here. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I wanted to make change. So you found that one person. I found that one person. And it's that alignment with that one person who was like, you know what, I see you, I see you working, I see you wanting to do more, let me help you. Um, and that also, I think in, at this time in my career has been helpful, is finding that one person. Sometimes it's not gonna be a bunch of people that are gonna see your vision and are gonna see your dreams. But if you align with other people who are going in that right direction, I think that that's also helpful. That's, that's awesome. I'd also say you, you have to, you have to see it within yourself. I've had so many people who have come to me and they're like, I have this vision, I have this thing that I want to do, but I don't really know if it's right. Or I've had people who are maybe older than me that said, maybe I should pump the brakes. And what I always say to those people is when you get a vision and when you are thinking about it, you feel it, you dream about it, you have to bring that to life. You have to bring it out of you because that vision was planted within you for a reason and it's likely going to make a change in the world. So I want to talk about that vision a little bit and, and, and talk a little bit about what it means to organize, what it means to engage a community. We talked a little bit about how you discovered that passion. We've talked about the support mechanisms that you were able to develop to get you there. But now that you're there, now that you're knee deep in, in, in the work of Newark, in, the, in, the, in its in the revitalization efforts and getting people to vote and participate, Talk to us a little bit about what a career in community engagement, in, in uh, community affairs, what does that mean? For those of us out there who, who are interested in that kind of a career, um, why, I think we all understand the importance of getting people involved, but how do you create a career about it? What, what is it that you do um, on a daily basis where people can expect that, you know, what, where they can expect what kind of work it comes out of, of, of the work that you do. Right, right. So I think that there's probably for any organizer I've ever met, there's one particular moment that happens for them where they realize if they do not start galvanizing a large group of people around this effort, then there will be no change. And I think this happened for me when I was working for KIPP. I was running a Get Out the Vote initiative. And you know what? I'm just going to stop you real quick just to make sure. Does everyone here know what KIPP New Jersey is? Okay. Because you've mentioned a couple of yeah, times. Yeah, so, so KIPP New Jersey that? is a charter school in Newark, New Jersey, um, also in Camden, New Jersey. And they are a part of a network of high performing charter schools across the country. Um, and so I was doing a get out the vote effort, C3 effort, and I was just, I was at a polling place and I was asking people, I was like, are you, are you coming in? Are you going to vote? This is your polling site. And so one guy came up to me. He was like, yeah, I'm going to go vote, but uh, I'm just going to vote for the person on the flyer. And I was like, do you know anything about the person on the flyer? No, I just got a bunch of flyers. I'm going to go and vote for that person. And so that to me was the, the first moment where I was like, okay, this is, not, this is not okay. We have members of the community that are going to vote and when they go to vote, they actually dictate because now it's, it, it was personal for me before because I was born and raised in Newark, I own a home in Newark. But now it's even more personal for me because I have two babies in Newark, I have a husband in Newark. And so if the future of my community, the future of my family is dictated on, on potential people who are not even educated on who they're voting for, we have a problem. And I think the second thing is we were running a phone bank and this was around the same time. We were calling people like, go vote, we need you to go vote, we need you to go vote. And I remember about 20 times in one day, I had phone bankers who looked at me and they were like, they said they're not gonna go vote because they don't believe in it. And that was the final straw for me where I think I knew for sure if I'm not working to organize large groups around understanding the importance of voting, then we end up in predicaments like we're in right now, um, where you know we have to figure out what the future holds at a local level and at a national level. Um, so it, what I would say about organizing first is you have to, there's one thing that will happen, one moment for you in your life 
that strikes. And when that moment strikes, then that's when you know you have a deep-rooted passion to be able to organize groups of people around one thing. Um, and the organizing work is not necessarily about you being at the forefront because some people may be thinking, well, do I have to be the main voice? Do I have to be in the front? Do I have to be in front of the camera? It's not about that. It's about you getting a bunch of people who are aligned on a message and who want to act and actually making that change. So let's, I also want to make a distinction though that Community engagement isn't just about politics. So, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you. I'm gonna showcase for the audience something that I know you, you do um, on the side. In addition to Project Ready, you've created this amazing uh, city initiative in Newark uh, regarding uh, the dolls. And, and I, I'd love for you to tell the audience about um, what you're doing in terms of that initiative, but also related back to what you do for a career. I mean, what. The Doll Initiative is, is certainly not a political thing. It's not about getting people to vote. Um, but, but again, to give everyone a picture of what a community organizer can do um, that isn't political, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about that as well. Right. Um, so I, I mentioned that I have a, a two-year-old and a one-year-old. My two-year-old is my daughter. She's the first one I had. And when she was uh, two months, uh, I think Disney came out with an uh, African princess doll collection. And they were, they had all of the princesses, they were all African American. And I wanted Avon, even though she was only two months at the time, but I wanted her to know that she should be able to see herself in all of the things that she has and all of the things that she sees. Um, and I also wanted other girls to feel the same. And finally, I think it's very important that as leaders in our community that we're giving back. And so I wanted other girls to be able to see that. So we bought a uh, hundred of the African-American Disney princess dolls and we gave them to 100 girls. And while it was successful, I, I say that I had some questions about the dolls because all of the dolls uh, had straight hair, they had light eyes, they had light skin, and it's not that we don't come in those shades and we don't have straight hair, but it's that I wanted Avon and other girls to be able to see themselves in all the different ways that we see ourselves. So I got in touch with a manufacturer and I was able to manufacture a group of dolls that actually look like, I think, all of our girls in the city. And so on March 31st, we're gonna give away 500 of those dogs, which I'm excited about. And, which is amazing. Yeah. And on top of that, the, the dolls each reflect certain leaders in New York. Is that right? Right, so no, they don't reflect each leader, but I got a bunch of leaders, uh, women leaders around the community to write a letter to each of the princesses that we're going to be giving the dolls to. And so we got about 100 letters, and so we're gonna be attaching those letters along with the collection of dolls that we're gonna release on the 31st. And it's free, because I think that girls should, all girls should have access to these things for free. You shouldn't have to pay to see yourself. It's amazing, and, and, and I bring it up not just to showcase such a great initiative, but to also equate the work that you're doing in that area as a community organizing kind of initiative. Right. Yeah. I say that it, I mean, on, on the organizing, it's such a, a big job. If you go to look it up, there's so many different things that you could do, and you're right, it's not always political. Um, I, I run a, a conference called the New Jersey Parent Summit every year, and so we actually, uh, not last year, but the year before, had Leslie McSpadden come out, come out, who's Michael Brown's mom. And so if, for those of you who know the story, you know that uh, his mom actually, she lost her son uh, to gun violence and police brutality. And that activated within her starting an organization that would support other young men across the city in order to you know, have things to do to remain positive. And I think the last time I heard, she's actually gonna be running for councilwoman. So it, what I say in the process of finding your career and developing like who you are, it reminds me a lot of what Michelle Obama uh, said in her book about becoming. Every time she did something, she was becoming something else. You don't have to stop in one place. You don't have to feel pigeonholed to one thing. Just because you have a major someplace, you don't have to, you don't have to actually like go and do a career there if things change. Because life changes and things in your life change. 
and you have to feel very passionate and excited about the work that you do and know that it's making a difference for you in the way that makes sense for you. So don't always feel like whatever you're doing right now, you have to be doing. That this is all about the process of becoming over and over again in order to achieve what we need to achieve that makes ripple effects across the world. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to open it up in a second, but I, I did want to ask one, one more question um, as it relates to your career, as it relates to your professional development. Um, obviously, um, being a woman, being a mother, um, there is a challenge of, of, of balance, of finding that balance. Um, and it's something that, that all of us, in some capacity, are going to have to contend with at some point in our lives. You're going through it right now. You're also going through it during a moment of, as you mentioned, of dramatic change within our society, both uh, when it comes to our, our, what we're seeing in politics in Washington, but also perhaps what we're seeing in the future uh, as it relates to, to future leaders. We have, uh, I think, three or four women who have already announced that they're running for president. Mm -hmm. Woohoo, absolutely. <laughs> so, with all of that, what are you learning along the way in terms of balance, and, and how do you feel about the future when you when you either look out into the crowd here, or when you think about, you know, the fact that we have uh, more diversity in terms of uh, those who are running for national office? Um, how do, I, it's a bit of a loaded question, I guess. Yeah, it's a loaded place, loaded. But, but, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, talk about I'll tackle it. it. Talk about it, yeah. Uh, so I am excited about any and all presidential candidates that are running at this point. I think we all are. Um, I'm particularly excited about all of the women who are stepping up. Um, and, and also excited about some of our, our men, particularly our men of color who are standing up. So I, I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, uh, now that I'm running an organization, I'm a mom, uh, I'm a wife, and that comes with some roles and responsibilities, uh, I found that I got into a place where I was just like running, running, going, 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 and I never stopped. And I felt like if I did stop, I was going to disappoint one entity or the other. And I, I remember, and I'll share this with you all, because I think that the first step to making sure that we can remain balanced is by being vocal about moments where we weren't. Um, uh, about maybe three months ago, I was going to Smashburger, my husband, my kids, and I remember walking in and suddenly I was just like getting worked up. I was feeling overwhelmed. And when I wound up making it back to the bathroom, I had basically like a nervous breakdown. Um, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't, I couldn't get, catch my breath. Um, I had to uh, call my mom and, I'm sorry, getting emotional, but um, I had to call somebody and I had to ask them like, you know, can you, can you help talk me down right now? Because I, I, I'm feeling like I can't breathe and I, I could barely even get that word out. Um, and mind you, my husband is in the front, he's with the two kids, he's trying to get them to eat, and I'm in the back having a breakdown. I know I need to get it together to get back to them. And it, it was after that, not immediately after that, but probably a week after that, where I finally sat down and I talked to you know my husband and my family about it, and they were just like, you, you absolutely cannot feel uncomfortable with saying that you need a moment. Um, and you can't feel uncomfortable with saying that you need help. Very uncomfortable with saying I need help. Very uncomfortable. It's like, I've got this, I can do this, I'll juggle all of this. There is just an, an incredible balancing act, but I, I'm good. I'm, don't, don't worry about me. I'll worry about you before I worry about me. And um, that wound up having its ripple effects because it wasn't just that I was tired, but my, my soul was tired because I didn't give any time to recuperate, to rejuvenate, um, and I, I wasn't asking for help. And so mental health, I think, is something that it, we talk about it, we hear about it, you know, we hear about people that have committed suicide, we hear about people that have had anxiety attacks. Um, but what we what I don't think we talk about enough, especially in, in our our millennial community, I should say, is how are we balancing this all out in a way that's healthy for us? What are some of the things that we can be doing in order to maintain being healthy? I, being honest with you, I, I don't think I ever spent any time thinking about what I should be eating. What does it mean to go to the gym? Is this something that can help with stress? 
what does it mean to not go hard every day? Because every day, if I don't go hard, then I miss, I miss an opportunity here. Um, so I say that I don't, I don't think that I have the book yet on it. I would just say, talk to someone. Talk to someone if you feel like you're even getting close to a place where you may need help. Um, and don't feel uncomfortable to ask for help. Are you, are you finding that the current environment that we're seeing throughout the country, do you find inspiration? Um, absolutely, are, absolutely. Like, you know, so, the, uh, so, there, so for example, someone like Camilla Harris um, deciding to run for, for president as a woman, as a, as a woman of color, um, are, are, is, is that, do you find inspiration from, from leaders such as that? Yes, because I think ultimately what I think resonates through all of our stories is when we're, when we're trying to achieve more, there are so many people and things that may potentially pop up to block us. And so knowing all of the things that someone like uh, Kamalo has to deal with, knowing all of the things that women in leadership, even men in leadership have to deal with on a regular basis, people of color, students, uh, that we have to deal with on a regular basis, it, it makes me want to rally around her more. And it also gives me a sense of peace, knowing that there are people out there who are taking a stand, and it makes me feel like I should be taking a stand more. I say separately from that, what also gives me inspiration are all of the people who are coming forward with their personal stories about things that have impacted them uh, in terms of ways that their mental health may have spiraled downward. Um, I was speaking with someone from a member of my family, and they, uh, my, I, I'll say this also because I think it's important. My husband and I even had to go and get therapy, and it was in therapy that we were able to reconnect and we were able to grow more. But when I mentioned it out loud, a member of the family was like, you know, don't, don't mention, keep therapy away, you don't have to, and I was like, no, because it's when I free myself that I free others, and it's when others free themselves that they free me. And so I think that we always have to be able to feel comfortable with being open, because it's in being open that we actually can be all the wiser. Yeah, and I, I think that really resonates a, a lot, um, especially as it relates to the things that we've been talking about in the seminar, as it relates to um, how to deal with challenges, how to deal with challenges, whether it be uh, from an organization standpoint, dealing with the daily grind of the work that we have to do, or whether it be those challenges like, like we were talking about before, when in third grade a teacher makes a proclamation that could basically destroy someone. We all deal with those kind of negative points of negativity, um, and, and to have strategies or at least even just a, a connection with someone such as yourself who's gone through those challenges and, uh, challenges and survived them um, are, is an important part for all of us. Just a, a yeah, quick funny yeah. story, uh, and I, I forgot to mention this, but that same teacher applied for a job at Kit. And guess who was looking at the resumes? So you just back. never know. You never ever know who's gonna be where and who's gonna do what. Um, and no, she didn't get the job. She didn't get that job. <laughs> I, I kind of guessed that. So we are we are we're running a little short on time, but I wanted to make sure that there's plenty of time for questions, um, both as it relates to your career and, and some of the more personal aspects that you shared with us. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna actually flip mics with you. I'm yep, gonna give on. you this one and. Um, I'm going to ask the, the, the audience if anyone has any questions, and if you do, um, I'll hand the mic over, and then we can just pass the mic around. So uh, anyone who wants to start off, go right ahead. Come on. Hello, uh, my name is Julian. Uh, I have a question about Project Vision. Yeah. So um, I was going to ask you, is it hard trying to direct your vision to the other 14 members that's a part of it? Good question, yes. Um, what, I, what I found is, I started off and I would just say, okay, here are all of the things that we need to go and get done. And then I would say, now go. But I realized that I actually have to get on the ground with those people and I have to be able to essentially do every part of the organization. Because if people can see me doing all of the parts of the organization, then it helps to actually realize the collective vision that we have. And I say collective because I think that it's important when you're bringing people on board into anything that you're doing, that the people also see what you see, and perhaps they even see things you didn't see, and that's important too. 
Um, but I say if you're leading any initiative, don't be adverse to getting in the in the ground or dirty. At, at, like do it all, do it all, and they need to see you doing that. And that actually has helped us to be able to make a pivot in our goals um, in order to achieve the 1,000 uh, Northridge Vote by Mail initiative. Can you actually talk a little, I, I, I meant to ask you about sure. that. Explain to everyone what, what the Vote by Mail initiative is about and, and why that is so particularly important in terms of building collective change within the state. Right. Uh, so we realized in Essex County that only 8.8% .8 of people are actually opted into the Vote by Mail initiative um, versus another county that's similarly, similar to ours, Camden County. They're at, I think, 20.6%. And what the Vote by Mail uh, application gives you the opportunity to do is not only vote early, but make sure that you can actually vote. And so I've had some people that are like, I go to the polls. And I'm like, good. If you go to the polls, great. But if there's ever a moment where you can't make it, where you're traveling, where you're potentially caregiving, I know some of you may be local, some of you may not be, you need to vote wherever your home is or you feel, may feel compelled to, this gives you the opportunity to be able to do that, whether you can make it to the poll or not. And if you do make it to the poll, it's fine. You can still vote at the poll, whether you filled out the vote by mail application or not. So vote by mail basically allows uh, the voter a larger window in which they can vote. Right, right. And my, my goal with the project ready is to offer people, we leave no stone unturned. You make sure you can vote however you need to vote, and vote by mail is one of those initiatives. But great question, are you leading something right now? Um, in the past, I, I was a president for my chapter. I just okay. um, stepped down on the e-board. Mm -hmm. But that's a good, it was good for me. Okay, good, good, good. Any other questions out there? Got one right over here. Good afternoon. My good afternoon. Uh, my question would be, has anybody ever really tried to discourage you or take you off your path, what you've been trying to do like, with, with Project Ready and everything else? Yes, so many. <laughs> um, I can't even like count on my fingers how many people said it wasn't a good job, I mean, or a good thing to do. I was at working at Kip for 10 years, and so I probably could have retired at Kip. Uh, taking the leap to start my own organization was absolutely taking a leap and I think what I had to decide is if you know my my immediate family is down by that I mean my husband's down you know the bills can still be paid uh, my kids will be good then this is something that I need to do because if I don't do it then I just have this dream for nothing and that's what it became for me it was I was seeing it. I met and I would meet and I'd say, Matt, like this type of organization needs to exist in Newark because we need to be taking action and my hope is that whatever I'm leading up will actually do that. And so I, I'm not a believer in dreams deferred. I, I, I got to bring it to life. Uh, and who cares what other people said about me not wanting to do it? I, I needed to get it done. But absolutely, it was like maybe 40 people who said I shouldn't do this. But who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Got one right behind there. Girl. Got it. Hi, how are Hi. you? I'm, my name is Janae Plaza. Um, I'm a senior here at Bloomfield College. And I just wanted to ask you, how do you emotionally open up to the 14 people that you work with so that they can feel how you feel about your project? Like, I know he said, like, how do you get them to get your vision, but how do you open up to them emotionally? Yes, good question. I spend so much time with the team. Um, I go to their homes. They're open to come to my home. Uh, we have dinner together. We have drinks together. Um, soda and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, but we we do it all. We do it all together. It's very important to me that we're creating a culture of family. And so when you work on a team, it's not just about getting things done. It's about creating and manifesting a culture where people are excited to come in. They're excited to work with you, not for you, but with you. When I created the hierarchy model and introduced it to the team, I actually placed myself and our immediate leadership team at the bottom because we're in service to all of the people who are trying to work to get our kids what it is that they need. And so our vision is that we are there to remove the barriers that exist for them. We are not there to dictate what happens. 
So we, we place ourselves at the bottom. Um, and I think so far, I, I, I love my team. It, it's important that I show up for them, and it's important that they, they show up for me, and we do that. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, I'm actually doing a capstone project, which is about a very personal event in my life. So I have to use other people to help me with my project, and it's kind of hard for me to open up about the situation. Right. But at the end of the day, it's my capstone, so it's something that a lot of people from campus will be able to hear and go through with me. Right. So that's why I asked about it. Yeah. It's something hard for me to open up about, and um, like you said, um, I'm just like I don't like to ask for help, and when I'm going through things, I'll just I'll do it on my own. Um, so it's good to hear someone else that's kind of like that, and it's good to hear how you open up with them, um, whether it be telling them exactly how you feel or just bonding with them in another way. Yeah, I found that the the process of opening up about my my story personally and professionally has help me to heal i'm not sure what the story is but it it helps with healing and it also kind of like breaks ground it's kind of like when you go to plant uh plant a plant in the earth you have to like open up that space in order for it to grow and for it to manifest and so when you i think open up that space for yourself and you open it up for other people then you'd be surprised about the things that could grow as a result of you guys connecting because you just never know who is actually sharing a part of your story or almost all of your story and that actually can help you guys to drive toward the results sooner i found that just saying like i'm doing this can you help you have to connect you have to build a connection how do you learn how did you how did that skill how did that muscle get built in terms of that kind of leadership that we're talking about I mean, was it through experience i just didn't want to be fake i don't want to be fake i just I made that decision a long time ago. I want to be real, and I want to be real about all things. I want to be able to tell people, like, look, I, I'm exhausted. I don't know if I could do this. Can you do it? I want people to feel comfortable telling me if they lost a member of their family. I want them to feel comfortable asking me to come to the funeral. I, I, I want to be real. There's no other way that I would prefer for us to engage but for us to be our most authentic selves. I think it's when you put people in a box and you try to get them away from that, that you actually limit the potential of the relationship and you limit the potential of the development of both of, of your strengths and their strengths. <coughs> I think we, we're going to bring the mic back. Oh, did you have a question? Okay. I think we'll bring the mic back up for another question. Here. So um, when you were building that relationship with the people that's a part of Project Ready, um, was it kind of hard separating like your personal life through from business or was it like it had to be all the same had to be all the same because I have two babies and so it's gonna be some moments where like for example my kids wake up they both have the flu because when you have two kids so close they both get the flu together I can't make it into the meeting you guys are gonna have to take that and I, I just have to be able to have that open dialogue with them at the same time, I have to also be open to them. A lot of the people that I'm working with have families. And so I have to be understanding about things that come up with their family. And I think people really appreciate that. I appreciate that, and I think others do too. Um, do you believe that there are some people that, that don't feel that way? Absolutely, absolutely. I've known a lot. I, I've never worked for an organization like this. I, I definitely will give a give Kim and Jay that and some other places that I've been. But I know a lot of people who have, and so as a result, their family struggles. And I'm a believer that if we're all working toward the betterment of the community that we're in, wherever that is, then if I have you in a predicament where your family starts to struggle, that has ripple effects on the entire thing that we're trying to do across the community. Um, so I know organizations like this, I think, what, what I found is that there are some organizations I've, I've known of that particularly take advantage of students who have just come out of college because they don't know their rights. 
And so what I'd encourage you all to do or in, to spread the word is to make sure that you know your rights at a minimum so that you know what people can ask of you and what people can't ask of you. And also I think we're just in this culture right now where we're all just trying to live our best life. And if you are in a place where you don't feel like you can do that, then you have the opportunity right now to be able to switch out, switch in and out of it. You have to be loyal to the movement within you and attach yourselves to movements that you can feel loyal to, but only up until you feel like you can't be loyal to it. And then after that, you have to make sure you come back to yourself and what's important to you. So be loyal to your movement. Thank you. Any other questions from the from the audience at all? Anything to add? Any stories to share? Bring it back. Hold on. It's okay. So I know you said that you went to school in East Orange after you came from North, um, and I just wanted to know: is that the reason why you're still in North right now? From from going from North to East Orange. From North to East Orange. Um, no, I think. I've always felt a deep attachment to Brick City. Like I, I, I love Newark, I love the community. I love the fact that we can say that we are going to transform something. And I think that while it may take some time, we actually do. Um, I love the fact that we're kind of like an underdog and that excites me. Um, I, when I was about to get married to my husband, I told him, we can get married, but you have to know that I'm never leaving Newark. And if that's not okay for you, then we should reconsider. And he was like, what are you talking about? He's, he's still trying to get me out of Newark. Um, but uh, but he married me anyway. So yeah, no, I, I, I love Newark. Like, I love it. Yeah, Avon and Pilgrim, Pilgrim Village. Um, I'm never leaving Newark. I'm from Newark, and I just Good. feel like sometimes, sometimes it just feels like, well, I've been going here for a while, so mm -hmm. this area is very different from where I'm from. It is. And when I go back home sometimes, I'm like, these people are the exact same way when I left four years ago, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like I want to move and do better. Right. I want to get out of Newark sometimes. But then again, I see some of my family members there. My family still lives in, in Newark. You know, my nephew lives in Newark. He's six, he's Absolutely. in school, you know? And sometimes the more I want to get out and do better, it's like, that's where I always go back to. Yes. Because that's where, that's all I've known. No, I you understand, know? I do. I went to charter school and it was hard. Which school? Robert Tree Academy. Oh, okay, all right. It was really hard. Right. And I was like, why are they doing this to us? Like, it's really, really hard, you know? Sixth grade, you're doing seventh grade and eighth grade math. Right. Like, you were always advanced. And when I got to high school, it was like, nobody knew how to read or write. I'm like, wait, what? Like, it was a whole different world for me. And that's why I felt like sometimes, you know, that's the good part about me growing up in Newark. Like, other people grew up in other towns, probably better than Newark, or at least what they think is better than Newark. They think. And I came out still being at the top, still at, you know, as advanced as I was in school. So it's, that's why I like to know why other people like to stay in Newark. Because sometimes when I go back, I'm like, oh. No, I, I understand. Uh, a, a quick uh, story on that. I, when I went to college, you know, Hurricane Katrina uh, had hit. And so I went to New Orleans in order to help with the relief. I went two years later. When I got down there, it looked like Hurricane Katrina had just happened. And we were down there for what, like two weeks, and we were trying to revitalize the um, the ninth ward, which is I think the the probably it was one of the most devastated. And so at the end of that second week, I called my mom and I was like, I'm not coming back. Like I need to stay here. It's important. They need me. I I can't. And she was like, You're gonna come back. And I think we drove a van down. We were aligned with New Jersey Perk. So I was like, No, you know, I'm not coming back. And that night. I wound up sitting down with a, uh, a woman who was like a wise woman in the community and she said to all of us, Hurricane Katrina happened for us here, literally, but it could happen for you where you live, literally or metaphorically. And it was in that moment that I realized I hadn't done enough in Newark before I could leave it. But I say it's also in that moment where I realized I needed to do more and I had to pull out in order to be able to see all that I needed to do when I went back. 
So I don't discourage you pulling out in order to have the big picture. But what I say is, I think it's paramount that wherever you're from, you take a moment to be able to give back after you have that vision. I got on that van, I came back, and since then, I've been working toward the betterment of Newark because I, I can't leave it yet until I'm sure that I leave it better than, than I found it. I wanna, I wanna just touch on something that you just mentioned, especially as it relates to Project Ready. In terms of the work, connect the dots for us a little bit. So we're, we get more people to vote. Right. We get, the, the, we expand that window so people can vote, uh, not just on election day, but they have the option to vote in, a, in, a, in that broader window. Right. What kind of change do you hope to create? Um, thank you. What kind of hope, what kind of change do you hope to create from that effort? I'm hoping if we can activate more people to vote, then we can also in the process educate people around the people that they're voting for. And if we can educate them around that, then people will be able to be more aware of the policies that people push that actually impact our children. And if we can be aware of that, then we can actually start to make some real differences for our kids. I'll give you an example. Uh, Tiffany uh, Alashe, the budgetista, and Assemblywoman um, uh, Angela McKnight came together and they actually collectively pushed a bill in order to get financial literacy as a requirement in our classrooms. And it was because of that push that now our, our, the future, our, some of your siblings, perhaps some of your kids, my kids, are gonna have the financial support that they need in order to be able to be more savvy in this world financially. I didn't have that. I can't recall the amount of times I ran up a credit card, I went broke someplace, because I had no idea the importance of financial literacy at a, at a young age. And so if they can come together and they can do something like that, and we can get more people in office that can push some of these things, then I think that we can see some real change for our community. And so that's kind of the ripple effect that we're hoping to be able to create at Project Ready. That's amazing. Um, any other questions from, from the audience at all? Any other thoughts or ideas that anyone wants to share? You're welcome to speak up more than a couple times if anyone has anything else uh, to add. About the project doll you had mentioned earlier, uh -huh. you to contact the manufacturer. I love that you called it project doll. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a name for it, but now I do. <laughs> I'm a new project. Right, right. I got you. I got you. <laughs> uh, how did like uh, the conversation go with the manufacturer and everything when you uh, I guess requested for uh, to get the dolls like I guess customly shaded or custom hair and right. everything like that? They had already had mocks of it, so it was really easy. I was able to say, this is what I want, how many of them can I have, and then they were able to distribute within like, a, what, three weeks? Um, so it was an easy conversation. Yeah. And oh, maybe, where is that uh, going to be held? You said in Newark? Yeah, in Newark on March 31st at the Spruce Street Community Center. Okay. You're all invited. You're all invited. Thank you. Yes. So yeah, and, and I'll just say that, um, as you now mentioned before, they're going to be, Five hundred dollars uh, yeah. given to newer kids, and one of the things that we've been talking about is finding a way with that where this initiative can be just be provided to every child in Newark, so right. they can actually receive a doll yeah. that looks like them and 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 tells the story also yeah. of, uh, of of leaders in Newark. Um, we'll be aspiring toward that. Yeah, it'd be What's exciting. That? It's a it's an amazing initiative. Um, I want to thank Chanel for, for sharing her voice with all of us. Uh, obviously, um, the work that she's doing is of huge import um, to a city, to a community that all of us are connected to in some capacity. Um, I also think, too, uh, you know, in terms of example, um, the work that she's doing um, spells out another career path for all of us to think about um, in terms of giving back, in terms of using activism and engagement to create uh, change, positive change. Um, and whether we have a politician, a lawyer, um, a consultant, uh, a community activist uh, in that seat, uh, it's important for all of us to say and to know that um, this is a potential career. This is the potential pathway to that career. 
and for Chanel to share her voice and to educate us on, on, on yet another uh, opportunity is, is really wonderful. And uh, we thank her for coming to Bloomfield College and hope that she will make her way back here again. And Absolutely. As I would tell everyone um, at the end of these sessions, uh, feel free. Chanel's happy to stay for a couple minutes. And uh, part of this is also about networking. And um, you never know. I mean, just as Chanel had found that one person um, to inspire and mentor her, um, perhaps she could be that person to someone in the audience. So uh, thank you for joining. No problem. Thank you all for having me.